This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. What a great afternoon to start with. Look at the predator here lying in one of the water holes and the impala is drinking there. He doesn't know what to do. He's looking at the impala. He's facing the wrong direction. A very, very good afternoon and welcome to the beginning of our afternoon safari. And my plan is quite very easy this afternoon. I will be looking for the cats. My name is Sydney Pumurani Mikosi. And for in case if you need our attention, you can follow us us on Twitter hashtag Safari Live. You can also follow us on YouTube chat stream. So what is happening here is unusual. You can see we've got a predator right in the middle of the water hole and the impala is drinking behind. And this impala, before he got here, he did not even check if there is a predator or not. He was just concentrating. She was concentrating much more on the surrounding and went straight to that side. So the hyenas, mostly we see them active at night, but I can promise you hyenas, we do see them a lot doing their movements during the day. Specifically, if there is a kill around, you will see them going in order to have a chance to have something to eat. Now, the hyena is in the middle of the water hole because the sun is very hot at the moment, just to try to cool the temperature a bit. But don't get surprised because sometimes hyenas, early in the mornings and late afternoons, they normally go to the water hole before even the sun comes out in the morning and play by the water holes. Sometimes they also do mud wallowing. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Ado, uh, indeed this is a pool day. You can see that uh, earlier on uh, from the dam camp I saw the elephants were also having a swim and it was quite a lot of them youngsters were enjoying. Now we've got the hyena. So now I am going to fly you to the Masai Mara in Kenya before David loses sighting. He's got a bed at the moment. Fantastic, uh, Sydney, and a very warm welcome to the Mara Triangle. And we're starting with a feathered friend there, and that's a Tony Eagle. And she's just either warming herself. I don't know why she should be there. It's pretty warm for me because we're talking about 34 degrees and 93 degrees Celsius. My name is David and on camera today is Bungay. Bungay, a very good afternoon. Welcome all of you and remember this is a very interactive safari. Should you have any questions or any comments, talk to us. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. All right, back to our raptor there. That is a bird of prey. We'll call them raptors because of what they're able to do. Raptors coming from a Latin word, rappel, which would mean like something to seize or something to forcefully hold. Those are raptors and raptors are very many. It's any bird that maybe would be able to grasp or hold another one forcefully to prey on it. Uh, Lord Mo, you are right, those talons are no joke and Bungay is giving you the best from this ego here and they need those talons that are huge and strong because Lord Mo, they pick sometimes lambs and baby antelopes for example or when they need to kill other birds, they need them very much. Their legs also happen to be very strong and if you look on the beak, the beak is very hooked and very sharp at the end. It's like a dagger. So they need strong legs and the talons should be able to dig in any prey they pick up to fly with it if they do not feed on it on the ground. Tony eagles are very similar to the steppe eagle. The difference being the steppe eagle have the yellow line you see below the eye there is a little extended towards the back or towards the ears of the steppe eagle. Characteristic, all eagles having feathered legs, apart from the snake eagles. 
Arctic most snake eagles will not have any feathers. Well, I'll be moving on, but in the meantime, we want to take you back to Sydney to see what kind of predator he's still got. I am still here with the relaxed hyena by the water hole at the moment. We saw the impala coming to drink, which means uh, maybe hyenas are not considered a very strong threat, threat by these uh, animals such as impalas. But I think that impala did not notice that there was a hyena here until she left. I saw her running. It seemed like she realized on her way out. So look at those beautiful ears. Uh, Judy, it is normal for these kind of predators to be here at the waterhole for this long. This clan, the Juma clan, normally they used to go to the treehouse dam and also the twins dam and spend much time just by the waterhole specifically at the edge where there is mud you will see them with mud this is normal but now here where i am in the western side of the greater kruger national park sabi sand juma game reserve the sun is at 34 degrees it's quite very hot at the moment i'm not surprised why is he spending much time in that waterhole at the moment Quite a very a difficult name for me uh, to pronounce, and I will uh, get the name as I am explaining about the waterhole. Uh, this waterhole, it is indeed a man-made uh, waterhole. Alarm! Hey, it's a difficult one. <laughs> So this um, uh, water hole, it is a, a man-made water hole. You can see that uh, this, uh, at the edges there, you can see that we are refilling every time when the water is taking away the soil and also the branches there to prevent animals from opening for the water to uh, flow down the other side. So, but if you can check, the design of the water hole met all the requirements. Water holes are not just uh, designed uh, for animals to come and drink. There's a lot of things which has to be considered. For example, there has to be available cover for in case if the predators wants to hide. That is very much important. So if you can check here, the water hole does have some hiding areas for the predators to be able to act. There must have to also be bushes for the predators and animals to go and rest after drinking. So water hole does uh, influence the natural life where animals can hide for others to come to and drink and other animals after drinking can also hide under the shade. A safari isali, the hyenas, I have never seen them swimming by the very deep water. Every time I see them to the areas where you can see the whole body, you can see the, the, the big part of the body showing out. If you look here now, you can see that only the bottom part is on the, on the ground and you cannot see uh, the, the stomach. But from the side of the stomach up, you can see this uh, animal. So if you look at the neck, the neck doesn't have spot. So if you don't check properly, uh, it's difficult to even tell that this hyena has got spots. It's like it doesn't have spots at all. All the hyenas, if you check them, here by the neck, uh, it, they, they are not spotted. The spots are only uh, around the bodies. So now let's go to the lions, one of those animals who are seen uh, fighting with hyenas for food mostly. Good afternoon everybody, welcome to the Mara Triangle in Kenya. My name is Steve, I'm joined on camera by Big James at a beautiful 28 degrees Celsius, 82 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a wonderful afternoon to search for cats, it's not hot. There could be lions moving, they could be hiding in the shade. We checked this area this morning, 
all the way down that side. We checked this here in our route all the way back to camp. We didn't find the Aweena Pride. So what we're going to do is we go up ahead. There's a road that takes us to the Scarpin Road again, and we're going to go sort of south along that. Maybe we'll be lucky and spot something in the form of cats. That would be wonderful. That is our objective for the afternoon. We weren't able to find them this morning or yesterday, but today we are going to try and find the Aweena Pride, the pride of five individuals. Very recognizable by the adults. One adult is quite uh, pale in color and the, the young male is also very pale with a very nice or very interesting injury on the inside of his back of his left hip, which is healing quite nicely. But there's an abundance of zebra and buffalo through this area. And uh, well, we did check this side this morning, but we didn't find anything. So maybe on the right hand side, we'll be able to find something in the form of an Aweeno Lioness which would be wonderful. I would like to find them for you and of course along the way who knows what else we'll find. There'll be, there'll be birds and uh, there'll, be, there'll be the wonders of the wild so please send your questions through hashtag Safari Live. Uh, drop your questions or comments also on the YouTube chat stream. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know if you have any queries or uh, suggestions for the afternoon that you'd like to discuss on this wonderful Sunday afternoon. It is very hot down in Juma, and while we are blessed with a pretty average sort of temperature. <laughs> Puma, the winners are indeed the underdog pride. Only two lioness, they were essentially a breakaway from the sausage tree pride, which David has been spending a lot of time with of late. And well, they're trying to make their mark out here. And uh, well, you can see the zebras are everywhere at the moment. Lots of rain has been falling along this escarpment over the last couple of weeks and well the grazing is phenomenal. It's not as tall as when I came a month and a half ago when the thousands upon thousands of animals moved through here and pretty much mowed it right down, the, the living lawnmower service. But uh, they are still in place, they've come back. More zebra here than when I got back from my leave two weeks ago. And the buffalo are everywhere. Elephants are in huge abundance. And well, all we need to do is, between all of that, is scratch out some lions. But importantly, what is it that provides the ability for lions to stay in this environment? And why do lions form prides? And well, these are interesting topics of discussion. Um, obviously, lions being a savannah hunting specialist, prides developed due to the large prey items that developed when the savanna opened up and created what they reckon 200 times more animal species than what the forest would have allowed before. All the different feeding regimes, all the different grazing heights, the different browsing heights has allowed for an enormous number more mammal species than there previously were. Lee, the grasses, I suppose they do smell quite nice, quite fragrant, almost like a very nice Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, well, lots of people like to describe Sauvignon Blanc as fresh cut grass, which if you happened to find yourself close to the nose of a zebra while feeding, you'd probably get that crisp, fresh note on the nose. Oh, that's just made me rather thirsty on this Sunday afternoon. I'm sure that hyena down in Juma wouldn't mind a cold beverage while cooling down in the pan. And, well, animals that don't need to cool themselves down too much. Not far away from us, David Gitu is with a very tall giraffe. Alright, let's have a little change and look at these tall animals of the African plains, of the African bushes, and these are the Maasai giraffes. And sometimes they'll forget to use the advantage of their height and just go for some bushes that are pretty low from the ground, like the capas bush. And they'll always be picking on the leaves from those bushes. Giraffes being browsers, they will not be bothered to eat any grass, small little leaves, twigs. And that was nothing, apparently, which is quite something, eh? Well done, Bungay. I was wondering what that young calf was doing and just realized she's not in what a position to be in there. 
Yeah, I mean, the phone control is pretty awesome because I don't remember the last time. I said, oops, come on, mama. The mother was not very amused. She thinks it's time for her to start feeding on, you know, to be weaned and start eating the normal food. But that's pretty cool to see a, a giraffe uh, just nursing there. I mean, see how tall the mother is, and when they give birth, and I'm assuming this is definitely her baby, they, they drop the babies from such high height. Sharon, I'm happy for your comment because even for me, I'm trying to walk back and remember the last time, Sharon, I saw a giraffe nursing, and it's a long time. Zebras we see every day, lions, especially the cubs, we see almost every other day. <laughs> but Sharon, I don't remember the last time I saw a giraffe. And this big, because look, look at that baby, she is almost the same size as the mother, you know, she's big calf there. She should, you know, be feeding on the leaves like the rest. So that kind of bush is what I guess she should be feeding on. But she's saying, if I'm the only maybe baby of the mother, why don't I keep enjoying the milk? Notice she's a bit light in color than the mother, of course, one, because of the young age, but not necessarily. We get some giraffes that are dark even when they're young, depending on their genetics. different types of uh, giraffes in East Africa. This one being the Maasai giraffe. We have another species that we call reticulated. Christine, good question. Do female giraffes fight as the males do? I would say no, Christine. They might have little squabbles here and there, but I would say, Christine, male or female giraffes do not get into that combat like the males. And uh, it should be about two months ago, I'm not sure, Christine, you had, or you saw we had two male giraffes that fought to death, which was quite unusual. If you get two giraffes male fighting, one will always die and maybe the winner survives. But in this particular case, this is about two months ago, we had two male giraffes and they fought to death. And that's why when you look on top of the ossicons or the horns on top of the giraffes, the males one are always blunt or bold or flat because they're always engaging themselves in combat once in a while. Sometimes for mating rights, you know, sometimes they want the younger ones or the losers to submit to them. And of course, if you want to be the dominant male, you must prove to the other males why you should be in charge. So it gets the giraffes either in thickets like that or sometimes way out in open area while they'll be getting some leaves and other small bushes. Hello there. Pretty tall animals. And having three different or four different species of giraffes say in Africa, everything else is the same apart from the body pattern. That's only the thing that would change and see them looking differently lifespan, gestation period, you know, size as much as the reticulated giraffe, a little taller to me than this one's here. And again, remember, this is a very interactive safari drive that we do. Keep talking to us, questions, comments, Twitter using hashtag safari live. Chris, good to know. I'll tell you, ideally giraffes to me, I could be wrong, and maybe my friend Sydney and Steve might want to disagree with me. Chris, I have found out giraffes are the most careless mothers that I know of. When you talk of big animals like this, I think giraffes really don't care. The times you see a giraffe and a mother and a calf, like almost a kilometer or two kilometers away, which doesn't make much sense because they expose them and they make them very vulnerable to would-be predators. A little scratch there. On the back, I do not know where the ox pickers are. Ox pickers are types of birds that will come and remove the mites and the ticks. That was a big scratch. She kept scratching. Very good. Good entertainment from the Masai giraffes. We'll take you again across to South Africa to Sydney and find out what he is up to with his highness.
So the hyena is still very much stationary at the moment here. Not only the hyena is uh, trying to avoid the sun at the moment here where I am, I just want to show you some, uh, something else from a distance also is uh, under the tree since we have arrived here. You can see that we have got uh, a small head of the elephants. They are also under a very big marula tree. They have been there for quite a while now. So it means the 34 degrees Celsius I have indicated earlier, it is uh, giving this animal some sunburn this afternoon. So what I'm going to do now is that I will be heading towards the Chitwa Chitwa area as I have been uh, uh, updated earlier on that the lions has been spotted earlier around that area. I want to go and see which pride is that. And then later on, we'll come back here and see if we can find the spotted cats. <laughs> uh, Hosala, if he was here, uh, was he going to chase the hyenas? Sometimes they do chase each other, sometimes not. These hyenas sometimes can be very much ignorant to Hosala. They come and they look at him, and after you see them looking at him like this, when he is trying to open the mouth to show his aggression, they just turn and go. So Hosala, by this time of the day, mostly is when he is resting. He will come to drink soon as the sun starts to cool down. But possibilities of the interactions, they are very high, but hyenas are not that very much afraid of uh, Hosanna at the moment. Maybe as time goes on, when he, Hosanna is starting uh, to gain a lot of strength and to try and show that he can fight, there will be some lot of uh, uh, challenges to the hyenas. So he's listening to the impalas at the background who are also coming to drink. <laughs> Isabella, indeed, this hyena looks so relaxed, not worried. It's just listening to what is happening. Don't get surprised when hearing other vehicles' engines. I am not alone at this beautiful sighting. There are other people here with me. But I am going to leave this relaxed hyena now and see if we can find Maybe we might be lucky with those lions when we get to the Chitwa Chitwa area. Later on, I'll come back here and see if we can find the spotted cats. But before I come here, I will try to drive the cheetah cut line just to try and see if we can be lucky with the Tingana or Talamba in that area. Later on, I will also visit the hyena den if the time is still available for us to do so. So I am the only one out at the moment, so I will be uh, driving a lot, visiting different areas. So now let's uh, cross over back to Steve by the Masai Mara, who is still with the lions. Apologies for that technical uh, error when it comes to the signals. I am now making my way to the Chitwa Chitwa Dam. I'm just going to pass by the jackalberry tree where Osana was hiding some meal yesterday and the day before. This morning I also got some update that Osana took a small baboon and he ran away towards one of these areas chased by those baboons. So baboons, they can be so very protective. Nothing is left. Oh, only a small bit of the uh, intestine is hanging there, but I'm not seeing anything uh, too much. So I'm just gonna check here by the dam wall, because sometimes from the top, I can be able to spot him. He prefers to lie down somewhere here. Now I'm not seeing him now. Let him let me give him some time. I will come back. Let me first go to Shitwa Shitwa. We might be lucky with him when we come back. Chetty, I didn't get your question very well. I hear the question is related to the hyena in water.
The uh, therapy, the possibilities, oh, look at this. Uh, this uh, impala here, I can see the stomach is very, very big. It's so heavily pregnant, might deliver at any time. Maybe that is one of the reasons why this impala is isolating herself from the others. If you look at that body now, you can see. So the baby can arrive here at any time this week. So the terrapin, possibilities of the terrapin to pick up some of the things are not from the body of the hyena but of the hyena because when the hyena is there now, yes, possibilities of some of the ticks uh, to come off, they are very much high. So I'm sure hyena, because he cannot see underwater, if he get touched by something else, he must have to go out. <laughs> So I don't think he will allow the terrapin to touch him when he's under the water there. So now let's go back to David who is looking for the lions at the moment. Well, my plans have been to also look for lions like uh, Sydney. But as much as he is going to Chitodam, should he not even get lions? Chitodam is always full of activity. And on my way to the lions, I'm thinking of looking for today. I've bumped into this, I would guess, should be a male elephant. Not very far from the marsh area. And you can tell he's just feeding on that nice green grass. This area has underground water. And even times when you have big drought, the grass here remains very green. And you have seen so many animals crowding this one small area during difficult times of drought in the Mara Triangle. Males will always be on their own. All right, having my elephants just eating, I think we've got elephants could be doing something interesting. Well, thanks, David. We have indeed got elephants here, two bulls that we're having a little bit of a pushing, shoving match. And the typical, typical sort of behavior that an elephant does once it's been dominated or sort of displacement behavior to show that it's being subordinate is they turn their shoulder like the one on the right hand side. Um, it was being pushed and it decided, no, I don't like that. A typical behavior when one elephant is dominant than the other one often you'll see a big bull walking into a group and one of the younger ones will just turn away like that one on the right and that's a very good sign of one being submissive and well they were having a bit of a pushing shoving match and it wasn't very serious but the one on the right is obviously smaller and didn't quite like the attentions of the bigger male and well we've got some buffalo as well lying up in the in the open Oh, well, I think they're lying up. Some are lying up. Those are standing, in fact. The grass is very long over there. The preferred habitat of buffalo. Nice, long, juicy grasses. I do like nutrient-rich grasses as well. Here we go. We've got a couple lying up, enjoying a bit of a rumination this afternoon. No doubt if it was as hot as it is in Juma, they'd probably be lying up in the mud, keeping themselves nice and moist and cool and yes the blood serves a secondary purpose the mud I mean of keeping the flies away and a third purpose of eradicating any parasites in the form of ticks that they might have but let's have a look at these two bulls and see exactly if they're going to get up to any nonsense again seems as if the shenanigans is now over and they're going off onto their feeding not much time for play when you have the requirements of so much food per day that elephants generally have and big males enormous amounts. Scotty they're not hiding they're basically just having a bit of a chill. Uh, they've probably been feeding for a period of time and now they're all just lying down taking a break resting their tired legs. Well those two are not they're still feeding very inquisitive looking at us 
Um, the others are resting. So when they sit down and ruminate, they're actually resting. They're meditating. Their bodies are resting because they are not using their legs. So they're taking up the weight. And, well, their mind is in a state of meditation. Very automatic response. And it's for that reason that ruminants don't necessarily actually sleep. They just ruminate and get up and feed and then ruminate and get up and feed. It's a constant, constant battle out here for, between rest and feeding. And how simple would life be if we were able to eat grass and get everything we needed? How simple would it be? So simple. Plenty of grass around. <laughs> Emma says, as long as we can put some form of dressing on it. Yes, yeah, so well, these animals get by eating quite dry, sometimes quite undigestible sorts of food. But um, out here in the Mara, especially after the rains, these grasses, you can see around the buffalo's legs, there's some brown patches and then green patches. Now, essentially, what that is, I've got some of the grass on the dashboard for you here, so we can have a little look-see and see what's going on. And it is, in fact, the red grass, or the red oat grass, known as red grass in South Africa, the Thamida triandra. You can kind of see the remains of sort of the inflorescence there. You can see which one, that one over there. Just see the three sort of triandra. There we go. It's kind of fading because the grass went through a reproductive stage, uh, produced its seeds, and they've probably fallen on the floor somewhere. And the brownness, if I just pull this grass out, you'll see I've grabbed an entire piece of the grass here. And um, where the grass grows, so here is the base, here is the roots, and that's anchored in the ground. Obviously, a lot of the nutrients can be stored in there, and the roots are designed for picking up the nutrients derived from this very nutrient-rich soil, uh, and the rainfall facilitates that, and then the grass will grow. Um, what we can see in parts of it here, sorry, James, I've made a mess of this. Let me just grab this piece here. What we can see here is the new growth growing out over here. So there's some old growth over here from earlier this season, and then you can see the new growth is popping out here. That's what the, the buffalo are absolutely loving right now. The zebra as well, quite enjoying that. So a second growth for this grass this season. Being a perennial grass, they'll be around for more than one season. And I know you're all wanting me to try it. Yes, it's very... Mm. It's not bad. There's, as Emma says, it could probably do with the dressing. <laughs> could probably do with the dressing. And the idea behind the ruminant is to, to be able to chop that up and chew that up to be able to maximize, yeah, be able to maximize this grass into small little particles for digestion. And Rubina, you want to know how much grass the average buffalo can eat? I actually have absolutely no idea. Um, Mm, sorry, I've got a few bits of grass stuck in my mouth. I actually have no idea, Rubina. I know that buffalo can drink about 30-odd, 40-odd liters of water per day. Well, they require to. And the grass, well, they need... I'm going to find out. I'm going to find, Rubina. I'm sure I can find it somewhere, but I don't know at the moment. Uh, but in the meantime, David has found some very playful young elephants. I think it's going to be a very good day today for Ellis. The first bull I had, then Steve had two that were like going for each other. And I have found a breeding herd with this youngster here showing us how much he can eat and how efficient she is picking the grass there. It's very similar to what we call coach grass. And I've always wondered what an elephant can do without a trunk. A very important organ to elephants. And these are the African elephants and most of the savanna elephants. A little different from what sometimes we call the forest elephant, just in terms of size. Walking away there. See how majestic when they walk. 
if it approaches the grass and doesn't come out, they'll always give it a small little kick with the leg. And they're very choosy sometimes. They pick choosing just the green one. So you can see not just sometimes just grasping grass for the sake of grasping grass. They of course want the right grass with the right nutrient. And what I want to do is just have a little change, a little change of the angle because we have another one that has a calf here. And I think Bungay wants us to shoot that one. Can I keep coming, Bungay? Keep coming, keep coming. That's good. And this one seems to be like a mother and her young one, who I guess could be less than two and a half years. Still no tasks that are showing up. And you can see the characteristic pose for elephant when they rest and they lift up one leg. He just put it back. Not sure the young one is just eating was just being full of nonsense and putting grass and kicking it. See all the wrinkles on the trunk. This is very nice and I'm guessing they only what about uh, 15 meters from where we are. And so long as these animals you kind of behave yourself, you're not very loud, you're not, you know, the engines are running. You can have the best time with elephants, which happen to be my favorite animals of all the animals that we got in Africa. Going very close to Mama. What a shot. How nice is that? Sinak, good question. We are talking about underground water. You see that elephant there, and you can tell he is, seems to like to be wearing some socks. That shows he was he was wallowing at one point, and the short rains have not come very well out to Sinak at the moment, and it's still dry. And some rivers and streams have dried up, but of course not the marsh area as I was talking before. And the other day I found some elephants that went to a river. And being intelligent as they are, they will always tell, like hydrologists, where to source for water. And the elephant, using the trunks and tusks and legs, dug about three feet, and apparently water popped up. And I'll tell you, Sinak, that water should be also good for human beings. It was out on a drive, and I would have forgotten my water, and I was thirsty. Sinak, I would definitely drink that water, because it would be very clean and very sifted by the sand. One more time to say goodbye to these elephants before we move on. And I think they've got a different area, so we're going to be moving on to source for other stuff. All right, elephants, we're gonna say. Daniel said, what about the mum? Sorry, um, there was an elephant trumpeting behind me there. Daniel, I get to comment and you think the mom is quite small and most likely Daniel would guess that could be maybe her first calf and from what I saw she looked pregnant again so if she's about three they might take four or five years before they get another baby but in terms of size I agree with you she looked a very small mama and most likely that could have been her, her first calf it would happen for such small cows Anything nine to ten years, Daniel, you know, cows are fully grown and mature and sexually mature and you could easily, you know, just get uh, a calf. We have another one here which also looks to me another young cow and let's try and compare this to the very first one we saw. And quite a number of them are breeding hard. That also, Daniel, looks like a young cow with her calf too. But if Bungay is swing to the left, there's another herd and there's one fully grown or big female that seems to have one tusk. Excellent, thank you very much. She's a very big cow.
Christian, good question. How old must the you know the calves be before the mothers get pregnant again? I would say anything four or five years should be a good age. Anything four or five years should be a good age before the mother can get pregnant again. I mean, it's such an investment, Chris, for a cow to carry a baby for like two years. So they want to do the best they can. You see that one putting up the trunk up. They want to do the best they can to make sure that baby matures. They have worked so hard for two years carrying that baby, going through the labor. So they have to take some time until they're guaranteed that the baby can survive on its own before they can conceive again. I'm sure we all know among the animals in the wilderness, the elephants got the mammary glands between their front legs. Many people will always miss that point, as Bungay is showing you there. We have seen viewers seeing calves nursing and wondering what those calves are doing, and we tell them they're nursing, and they're like, they're nursing at the wrong place. But yes, that's where the glands or the mummies of the female car of the female elephants are. So many reasons to not have the other task. Could be a genetic reason, or sometimes age, sometimes when they bring down bushes or trees, they crack them and of course once they lose them, that's it. They are left with one. And also the ear looks very torn. So I would say this is a very senior citizen from the look. She's quite a mature cow. The right ear looks fine. And the Times have made jokes saying the African elephant's ears look like the map of Africa. And the ones for Asia look like the map of Asia. But not exactly so. We'll always say that when you have kids with us on the show. But one thing is a fact. Both males and females here have tusks. A little more you're talking about calving and depending on the animals we are looking at and comparing the difference between here and Juma. Elephants to me will breed all around the year, they'll have babies all around the year. But should we look of different species of animals like the wildebeest, they have a particular season that will bring down the babies and that will be the month of February and that mainly will be in Serengeti east of Serengeti in Tanzania or the western Gorongoro conservation area in Tanzania. But the wildebeest that happen not to go or tag along with them during the migration that, that remain here in Kenya, they apparently get babies at the same time. So around February, both wildebeest and, you know, in Kenya and in Tanzania, they'll have babies at that particular time. But elephants and giraffes and all the other animals will have babies all around the year. very lucky elephants can adapt to eat both grass and bushes they're like mixed feeders it's very difficult to see elephants struggling of hunger because they'll always have a lot they have much choices of what to feed on Neil, that's a very good question and uh, it has been claimed or you want to know elephants where they have twins it has been claimed they do personally i'll tell you for a fact of my all my ears in the bush i have never seen an elephant with twins but it is very possible most of the animals here will always get one calf one baby be they rhinos elephants or even the antelopes talk of the wildebeest zebras but it has been claimed that occasionally they get twins i have never seen an elephant with a twin bungay have you seen one as Bungay says he hasn't seen one, as they majestically walk across the road in front of us. And I would guess that, that calf definitely, that is the mother. Following the footsteps of mum, don't want to stay very behind. Occasionally they get predated by lions. Lions will always hunt any animal they think could offer them an opportunity. As, as I was saying before, it would be for a number of reasons. Looking at it on a genetic point, the elephants that are born with one task, the elephants that are also born with zero task, not even one. 
but also they use their tasks either to fight to dig for water to bring you know food down when they're breaking the branch the branches that could be another reason to lose the other task as they get old it's also possible the muscles that hold the task to get weak and maybe lose it or it could have been an infection so all these possibilities could cause this particular ellie to have only one task sometimes we say elephants are either right-handed or left-handed and if this particular one is right-handed and kept using the one on the right so much that could be another reason tear and wear as much as the tusks of elephants keep growing they're like made of carotene protein just like our human hair or nails and they keep growing all their lives very majestic they got very padded foot if you would be like lying next to the grass of that elephant unless you listen carefully you might not even get the vibration as she walks and that's pretty beautiful MCs and the background of the trees and the different shades of green there well done Bungay either to me she is pretty big female and either very full I'm not sure that she is pregnant or not looking at the calf which I think is maybe less than three years did you lose your calf is she is still walking they always keep the babies very close. I was talking earlier of some of the animals that I think are careless mothers. And I mentioned the giraffe is one of the animals I think don't do a very good job. Very good. Elephant is one of the big five in Africa. And I think Sydney is trying to track another big five in South Africa. I have got the lions hunting a water bark at the moment here. Anything can happen at any time. I can see that these lions, the water bark is slowly approaching and that water bark is looking, looking, but so far the water bark is not seeing anything. And I don't even know which pride is this, but I can see that these lions are very much static and the water bark is in the middle of the uh, bush now. Oh, the guinea fowls are starting to give some warning calls, which might even alert the water bark at the moment. You can hear some squirrels are also starting to make noise. So these lions are slowly coming, following the water back. I can see that. Look at that, look at that. Look at that, look at that, look at that, look at that. You can see the lion is, walk, is, is coming. They are, they are chasing, chasing, chasing. Look at that. They are chasing a water bark now. They are chasing a water bark and think they were too fast to chase that water bark. I don't think they are going to be successful here. Oh, that water bark managed to escape. They were too fast to go for that water bark. So they were not patient enough. Look now, I have got them right in front of me and the water bug got disappeared and not all of them managed to participate on that hunt. Think the right winger decided to go fast. So they still have got the interest of uh, going further, but I think the right winger made a mistake because she started running without communicating with the left winger and the other ones at the back. So it was coordinated, but I think the coordinator failed to inform the other members that now is the time we can go. So lions are the, the, the uh, pursuit hunters. The pursuit hunters, it means they hunt as a group and they coordinate, they work together, they've got different positions, they locate each other, quite a certain responsibility with the, the killers in the middle when these right wingers are cornering an animal, those are the ones who are normally taking down a big animal. Linda, they missed the water bark, and that was a great opportunity. So I thought they were going to to catch that because there was a nice available cover. It's just that that one started to run very fast. 
Somebody may, now they are, they are cornering a hippo. Let me pull forward now. Ah, they want to corner a hippo now. Let's see if they're going to win here. There might be another. Oh, they are giving up. They know maybe hippo is something else. I can see there is a hippo out of the water, and one of them is looking at the hippo, and this is happening right here in front of me. You will see where I'm going to stop now on my uh, left hand side. We are going to see this uh, lion. Behind the lion, you will also see the hippopotamus. But now they are not really going after that hippo. They are now lying down. And one of them is going very close to the hippo there. Him and the hippo are looking at each other. I said, distance is less than eight meters. Look at that. And the other ones are not interested to go join that one. You can see the hippopotamus is right on the background there. And the hippopotamus realized the lion is right in front. I can see what the hippopotamus is also doing there. That is moving the head all the time. So don't get surprised as well here. We are not alone at the sighting. There are some, uh, so there are some guests as well who are enjoying the sighting. So that lion who is very close to the hippopotamus has got quite a lot of interest. I think it's a young male. So the, the experienced ones are lying down here. Who knows? The hippos uh, is tough to take them down. So you can see that they are now very much relaxed. I don't even know how many these lions are, but it's quite a lot. I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've counted eight at the moment. There might be more than eight. You can see that uh, the one who was very close to the hippo is coming back because he did not get a lot of support. So the hippopotamus is not moving at all. <laughs> that one now uh, is leaving himself. He's just now uh, defecating right there next to the road. This is what the lions do the most when they wake up late afternoon. They isolate themselves for a while and they just go and defecate uh, to a short distance uh, from where they are. So we are very lucky to find the lions active by this time of the day. <laughs> Isabella, eight versus one, they can be able to make that hippo tired. But maybe they can see that is a matured hippo. And it's a territorial male. I can see that the outer layers of the eyes is showing me that it's dark. The darker color of the outer layer of the eyes tells that it's a male. A female is pink, so the males, uh, they can be very much aggressive. Maybe that is why they are now uh, moving away from the dangerous animals. We are very lucky to see the lions much more active. When the sun is 34 degrees, lions are conducting a hunt. Lovely, isn't it? <laughs> Joshua, uh, when it comes to hunting, you must have to uh, think about the following. Uh, the hippopotamus can run 36 uh, kilometers per hour. The lions can run up to 80 kilometers per hour. But the thing is, who is going to run first? When the animals are, are, are stalking a prey, remember, they make sure that the concealment is right. They hide and they surprise, they launch a surprise. Even if an animal has got a high speed, but if a surprise, if a launch has been uh, surprised, then the time you realize it's coming is too late. That is how these animals are catching their prey. So you can see now they are lying down again. Some of them are starting to lie down flat again. So the water bug was much more ideal to take down than the hippopotamus.
So now let's uh, cross over to the Masai Mara where Steve has got a lovely egg. Welcome back. Thanks, Sydney. I hope your, your lions happen to come across something to snack on and while hippos are a very interesting thing for lions to snack on as you'll probably see tomorrow afternoon. But look at what we found. Alone out in the bush, no nest, no adults, a single egg, ostrich egg. Look at the size of it. 24 eggs apparently in there, somewhere around that. And uh, well, it's rotten, completely rotten. I can even smell it on my hands now. Elvis is the, the ranger at the back who collected it. And he's pulling a very, very sour face behind me. And Oh, my word. So he was wondering, am I going to fry it? Or are we going to cook it? But it's definitely rotten. You can smell it. It's permeating through the shell. But isn't that an incredible sized egg um, for ostriches? And they'll lay a number of those on a, ne on a nest out in the open. And uh, the adults will incubate them at different times. But they'll first lay all of them at one at a time because it takes a good half a day, sometimes 24 hours to develop an egg. And they'll move away and then come back again, lay another one, move away. And then they will sit on the nest for a one period once all the eggs are there so that all the chicks hatch at the same time. Called synchronistic um, hatching so that all the chicks will hatch. And due to the size of this egg, there's an enormous amount of yolk and thus food to assist in the chicks to get much bigger than they would if they were in a nest in a tree or something like that. So that is a term we call precocial, meaning pre-developed. They come out and they're pretty much ready to follow mum around. They're just these little tawny bundles of, of, of down feather and they can follow mum around and peck and peck and peck. Oh, James is now laughing at me. Oh. It does not smell nice. I'm going to put it back on the ground next to the road where it belongs. And um, I don't even think a honey badger would be interested in this guy. Last one, Elvis. I've now got very smelly hands. And well, folks, I've been trying to oof, search the literature. The, the literature that's spelt with G double O G L E and my books for how much a buffalo can eat in a day and I can't find it anywhere. Lots of information telling you what a buffalo's diet is, but and concurring with me about 35 odd liters, some say 45 liters they can drink in a matter of minutes. Um, sometimes twice a day they'll drink depending on the temperatures. But nowhere can I find how much they physically can eat today. Uh, the reality though is that they are a bulk feeder, so they do feed on a lot of food. But if you go through a rumination stage, uh, you feed on a lot less than you would if you're a hind gut fermenter. So a zebra has got twice the amount of food going through than an animal of its equivalent size uh, that is a ruminant. And that is just going through, so it's in the gut for half the time. So ruminants. They can feed on a fair amount of food, but it goes through slowly, so they need higher quality food. Zebra, elephants, black and white rhino, warthog, well, they can just feed on bulk, quickly, quickly going through. And the gut retention time is very low. It's all sort of fermentation that happens sort of in the back of the guts. Uh, that's what causes them to be very, very farty, very flatulate big flatulators of the bush that is whereas a buffalo when the conditions or the vegetation gets quite poor they still feed on the same amount but they don't get as much quality out of a lower quality vegetation so that's one of the benefits of being a ruminant or negatives of being a ruminant versus a non-ruminant or hindgut fermenter is that when the quality of the vegetation diminishes as we've seen in Juma the dry season the buffalo last year everyone remembers I wasn't there but I saw some footage and there's carcasses all over the place. The buffalo do very badly, or lots of ruminants do very badly when the conditions are very poor. We're seeing it now with Inyala and Juma. I'm not sure if that's changed in the last couple of weeks. But zebras, warthogs, they just keep going on, keep doing their thing. So they're gonna feed more, uh, but they get better. They get more out of the quantity that they feed on, if that makes any sense. And it's all through fermentation in the gut. Oh. So I hope that clears, it sheds a little bit of light, but I'm not finished. I know there is a book out there, my friend's got one on grazers. 
and uh, it gives you all of this information. I know that information's there. Uh, if anyone has that information on them right now, please feel free to pop it in on a on a Twitter or ooh, on a Twitter message or on the YouTube chat stream. Let us know how much. Oh, James, I don't know what I've done here, but we have picked a road that has been disused for some time. Can you maybe say that question again for me, please, Emma, while I navigate this? very treacherous path there's a road by the way it's just disused james it's a very good question i mean ostrich chicks survival has really got to do with um a predation in an area i think you know you can get anywhere from sort of 10 to 15 sort of eggs being laid all those chicks will hatch or not all of them a lot of them will get stolen they are prized i mean that egg there is ideal have we spotted something that egg is an ideal food source for plenty of animals out here. Mongooses and badgers, even hyena, jackal will go for it. Even baboons, I suppose, and humans will go for the eggs. And how many survive? Well, the ostriches are very good adult, are very good uh, sort of parents. Sorry, I'm being pointed at something in the distance. We might have something of interest. I've got some topi. While we scan, let's see if I can answer your question better. So, th 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 I suppose they've got quite a high success rate in areas of low predation. But unfortunately, out on these sort of plans, there are so many predators uh, that ostrich ostriches, I don't know the exact number, but they've probably got a very low survival rate. We don't see too many ostriches around, and they are able to breed quite readily, which means they're able to have a number of chicks at the same time. And while I haven't seen any chicks since I've been here so there's a good chance that a lot of them are, are caught and eaten not only to to uh, to ground or terrestrial predators but also to aerial predators Isabella they are extremely nutritious and I've heard of people having ostrich omelets can you imagine the size of that Oof. oh smell is following us around so James I'm sorry I don't have an exact number for you on the success of ostriches. <laughs> Lee, I had my salad, yes I did, and now eggs for dessert. I could have saved some for breakfast, but unfortunately, I don't know about you, if any of you ever tried to eat a rotten egg? Ugh. I made the mistake once of, of making an omelette, of throwing the eggs into the pan, and then mixing it, or scrambled egg it was. Very big mistake. You've got to crack them each into a cup and then throw them in. Otherwise, you can really spoil whatever it is that you're trying to eat. I've done that once before. I'll never do it again. Learned my mistake. It only takes one rotten egg to spoil the batch. But yeah, James, I'm sorry. I, I haven't seen any juvenile ostriches since I've been here. A few females and a few males together, but none of that sort of small diminutive kind that uh, is... I haven't seen them so I, I su suspect up here the survival is quite low but in sort of the more arid areas where you've generally got less predators per sort of hectare I'm sure the survival increases quite a lot oh smell that that's a dead animal yes it is there's a carcass over here there's nothing quite like the smell of a rotten dead animal to take your mind off your stinky hands, that smell of ostrich rotten egg. <laughs> they have some lovely smells today. And uh, those smells, uh, I hear her in the darkness, goes, oh yes, oh yes, very exciting. Well, I know if the lions were around and the wind picked up and they smelled that, they'd probably get quite excited. But it seems as if Sydney's lions have decided to take a nap. So you can see that the Unkuhumas are starting to come together now. They are resting not very far away from the hippopotamus. They are just lying down at a distance of about 20, 25 meters away from the hippopotamus. So they are all coming together. So far I have counted nine. So the, the ninth one, I can see it is far behind. Maybe it's going to come this side much more closer.
So now they are doing what they are known for, sleeping long hours during the day. So that is the ninth one. So the squirrels are making quite a lot of noise, vocalizing against that one. So this squirrel tried by all means to inform the water bug earlier on. It's just that the water bug was not seeing what was happening. So the squirrels called, 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 and the water bug kept coming, kept coming, until these lions started talking and getting closer, and the last one decided to go first. The first one decided to go first without informing the others. So these lions, when they're hunting, they coordinate, make use of their tails and the tip of the ears. You see the ears moving every time and also the tails. So we didn't, we didn't see too much communication amongst that uh, group. So maybe when Joy, the hippopotamus, is just standing there and he might have been there maybe since uh, this afternoon or since this morning. They can spend much time standing like that. This is not very rare. It's what the hippos do when they are away from the water holes. Sometimes you, you can see the hippopotamus very long distances such as 16 kilometers away from their territorial water holes. And then they come back to the water holes afterwards. It's not very far away from the water hole, I can estimate that it might be about 600, 700 meters away from the water hole. So it's not very far. You can hear the others calling from the water hole. <laughs> MK, the hippo is trying to be invisible. So it means this hippopotamus got stuck here because of the lions, maybe. Why? Because the hippopotamus, it has been very hot and 34 degrees for him to stand there all day long is very bad to the skin. Hippopotamus, they do secrete some kind of fluid in order to try and fight the sunburn, but they must have to be going in and out of the water hole. Maybe this is uh, the main cause of him stuck in there without going to the water hole. So, but we just going to wait here and see what's going to happen the time he is moving back to the water hole we might see some action between him and the lions Uh, Michelle the possibilities are very much high we are talking about an adult hippo so this hippo is huge I can promise you these lions are ten, they are nine, and trying that hippo is a big mission. Hippopotamus can be very dangerous. He can injure some of these lions. Yes, there is records where lions do take hippos, but uh, it's not an easy exercise. Uh, Gabi, I think for nine uh, lions, the hippopotamus is um, is enough compared to the size of the water bag they lost earlier. They just got to eat this very thick skin. So that hippopotamus knows very well what is happening. He saw the lions and we, where he is, he can still see the lions and he's not worried about them at all. So you can see the young male is there at the moment, also resting. I think I saw another young male as well. So I cannot see where it is. When the lions are starting to grow the mane, normally it's when they're older than two years. So the mane is showing you that they are getting there. They are about to mature. It's just that it's going to take them one or two years again in order to be fully matured. So that may contribute a lot when it comes to the absorption of the sun. 
it's like a scarf it helps them when it's cold and it brings quite a lot of heat when it's uh, hot but it does serve for many other purposes such as the protection of the neck when they're challenging each other for territoriality Tick, tick. The hippopotamus, <clears throat> they can be very much strong. Sorry for that. Hippopotamus are very much strong animals. And if you check, within the whole animal kingdom, hippopotamus are the first group with a very huge record of killing people every year. When talking about the mammals within the animal kingdom, but the animal killing people a lot every year amongst the whole animal kingdom is the mosquito. So, but when talking about mammals, mammals are those animals with hairs, they've got mammary gland, they are endothermic, they regulate their own body temperature, and they've got a, a well-developed brain. So, when talking about those ones, hippopotamus is the first one. But when talking about everything, including insects, insecta is just a class. Insects falls under kingdom animalia. So they are animals. So you can see that this hippopotamus is not even uh, moving at all, it's just standing there. So this is what the hippos are doing as well. When they go to the buffalo hook dam, they get there and then they wait because there's no water now. You will see them out of the water. You're out of the uh, dry dam. So now let's cross over back to the Masai Mara and see what Steve is having at the moment. Thanks. We are South Bank, Sydney. Elvis spotted two serval. We've just moved in here to see if we can see them. They are completely invisible. How he saw them, I mean, seeing an ostrich egg from the road is easy, but to see serval, they're somewhere here in front of us. I can't see them. Can you still see them? They were here somewhere. Probably quite shy. They probably just ducked down. Just ducked down away from us. I remember how camouflaged these animals are. The disruptive camouflage or the spots is aimed to make them blend into the background. The stealthy, silent, camouflaged hunter that we could see a moment ago now is invisible. Yeah, I'm not sure either, M. Emma thinks she saw something spotted to the left of that termite mound. I don't see it. But they just have to lie down and they'll disappear. And I saw them from back there. I saw two, one adult and a youngster, moving. Maybe in a moment they'll come out again once they realize we're no threat. It is indeed Eagle Eyes Elvis Lauren. He is incredible. and. He was pointing it out and going this way, that way. We're looking with the camera, binoculars, and then we eventually saw them moving. Incredible. That's what you call a search image. When you spend a lot of time doing something, you develop a pattern recognition. You develop something that you see through bushes. You see around things and certain shapes materialize for you. And well, those serval materialized for Elvis and for us for just a brief moment and now they are gone. Absolutely incredible. Moving through this long grass in search of whatever food they might have. And it's possible that it's the adult female maybe moving one of her youngsters from one den to another. And not as relaxed as the female we saw not so long ago that's in a much more sort of vehicle rich area, many more people out here probably with the first vehicle that it's seen and the protective mum I'm just gonna keep scanning James sorry I'm very keen to show you all the serval 
Just goes to show how many. Just goes to show how many there probably are out in the African wilderness, and um, very hard to to see them all the time. But uh, Paula, you want to know how tall they stand? Um, total length is up to 120 centimeters, and they can stand about 60 centimeters at the shoulder. So two normal rulers. And so it's quite tall for a, a cat of their sort of stature. Uh, quite tall, but it's mainly their long legs uh, that provide that for them. They've got really long legs for a very small body. They don't have an enormous body, but the long legs enable them to stand quite tall and be quite elevated in this long grass so that they can see down and also to be able to jump quite high in search of any food. They've got that very nice pounce. They'll jump up and land on top of prey. And also by having their long legs, they're able to sort of look down into the grass and also gives them a little bit more of a vantage higher up so that they could actually move through with a little bit more stealth. They're not designed for being very fast, just for having a spring-loaded jump. And well, as you can clearly see, the camouflage works extremely well. Well, for those of you who have never seen a server before, I have got my trusty book here to show you the serval. There it is on the right hand side. It's a very beautiful cat. Very beautiful indeed. And look how long those legs are. Very, very long legs. Being stretched. And I know the photo doesn't do it justice, but they've got a very short stubby tail. The tail's actually cut off there. Um, but there we go. There is a serval with their big ears and that disruptive camouflage that assists not only camouflaging them while hunting, but also when people are trying to find them hidden in the long grass. Okay, well, we're around the corner. The sun is setting behind the mountain. We can't really get a good view, but that's why we work as a team, because David Gitu is positioned in just the right place. Very well done, Steve Ovo, for catching that savo cat. Quite, 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 quite exciting, I would say, to see them. And I think either him or someone else had seen a savo with some cubs the other day. But here we are enjoying the sunset. And Bungay has told me this is not called a sunset. It's called the golden moment or the golden light. I do not know what that means. But we are quietly here watching the sun going down in the Mara Triangle and Mara Triangle being in Kenya or we being in East Africa we are always 12 hours, 12 hours because we're just along the equator so our sunsets or sunrises do not vary very much, not for more than a couple of minutes we have standard sunsets and sunrises almost all around the area Bungay, what should you prefer? That's very beautiful, Linda, and I might take you back to that sunset. Bungay, would you like to take Linda back to that for a couple of seconds? Linda says, how beautiful. Thank you, Linda. That's a great comment. And Bungay is so kind. He has taken us back to that sunset for you, Linda. And look at all those colors. I don't know what or how we're going to describe them, but they're just gorgeous, amazing, wonderful colors. Bungay, what do you like more, sunset or sunrises? All right, I gave Bungay a question. He's saying, what can you see or what do you think? But in a way, he inclined to say he loves his sunsets. And Linda, I agree with you. That is amazing. The clouds coming down there. As the sun is disappearing in the western and maybe, um, if you allow me to ask all the viewers what they think, and they tell me maybe in one word tweet, what about that sunset to the western horizon? Just one word, you can tweet as usual, hashtag Safari Live, and tell me what you think of that sunset, because to me, it's out of this world. Out of this world are two minute words, Thank you, M. As soon as the answers start coming in, let me know. I said, is out of this world. That's not correct because that is more than one word. And what I'm requesting is one word. 
And I think things are going very well as much as I'm enjoying, enjoying the sunset here, Giraffe. I mean, uh, Sydney got some exciting moments. Look at that. I have got a giraffe approaching a lion pride at the moment. Two giraffes are coming, and I'm not too sure if these, these giraffes have seen the lions, but I can see that the giraffe is now moving away to that uh, nearest big tree, and you can see... You can see that uh, the giraffe is moving away. So it looks like the giraffe spotted the lions. So the lions, they did not see these giraffes coming until they saw them when they were too close and the giraffes are trying to avoid. They're, they're just passing by maybe 30 meters away from the lions and the lions are looking at the giraffes at the moment. And then they are going just behind the hippopotamus who is now sleeping. So they've got a very nice available cover, the giraffes. They, they are watching the lions from that angle. So these giraffes are avoiding these lions at the moment. And lions are now starting to wake up their heads here to check what's happening. Maybe we might also see something very interesting here, just like what we saw, what happened to the water bark. You can see that when the predators are near the water holes, things do happen. Look. Another giraffe is trying to avoid. Look, now we've got one lion interested. He just stood there, he's moving, facing one of the... So look at that, you can see another one is starting now to wake up. There is a gap between the two giraffes and the gap might be 50 meters. Giraffes are 50 meters apart from each other. Now that other one is following the first one at the moment. And between the uh, lions and the giraffe, there's a hippo, which is now a stumbling block as well. So I can see that the giraffes might come to the open space at any time, but not exactly where the lions are. So the squirrel is not stopping informing these animals about these lions here. So it looks like these giraffes are on their way to the Chitwa Chitwa Dam or to the nearest water hole. Debra, I don't think the giraffes will be able to run now, but the problem is the one who is moving now, the lion, you can see the giraffe spotted that lion. It's a young male. The hippo is standing up as well now because you can see the lion is moving. So that lion, looking at the size of the mane, is telling me he's still young, not well experienced, and is trying to take over the responsibilities which are for the females. Normally lions are omitted when this kind of hunts are taking place. And that is what is maybe uh, chasing the giraffes because the well-experienced females who are responsible of stalking and taking down an animal, they are here now. And that young male wants to interfere. And the giraffe spotted him. I can even see how he's standing, that he doesn't know how to approach professionally. Uh, James, I didn't copy the question nicely, if you can repeat that. So now you can see that the hippo is standing. So when, when I'm looking at these lions, looking at the stomachs, the only two lions I can easily see the stomach is the two mangani males. The two mangani males is what I'm going to show you now. Uh, these are the ones I can tell the stomachs are not full. But I know when these animals, when these pride has got a meal, the unkuhumas, they are prioritized. And these ones, they come last mostly. So when looking at the unkuhumas as well, the stomachs are not that full. So these lions, they are looking hungry. Look at that one standing now as well. You can see that the stomach is not that big. So it, it, it looks like the Unkuhuma uh, males are starting to recover from mange.
uh, it's not as bad as a few weeks ago. <laughs> Look at that. So now uh, that is the lion. Uh, I hope that lioness is one of the experienced females. You can see she stood up from here where the other females are. So if that one is now looking at the giraffes, it means she started strategizing the approach direction. But those giraffes, I can see they are very worried. They are at the back now, still looking at these uh, lions. So they're now moving away. I can see the one leading in front is now avoiding. Maybe the lions might try to follow them. We will see. Our beard, one of my previous guests. Uh, these uh, lions, our beard, you know, this uh, hippopotamus, our beard, is a fully grown hippo. So that is the hippo who can be able to defend himself. Uh, that one, it can be very dangerous. I can promise you, looking at that mouse structure, I can see he's big and mature. We might see a, a, a real interesting action here. Maybe these lions are waiting for the hippo to come out to the open space. So that is where the hippo is feeling safe at the moment. He doesn't want to move. He's just lying down at the same spot and he's standing at the same spot. So you can see now it uh, looks like the interest from one of the female who stood there last uh, is gone because the giraffes are now very far i can see now they are maybe at about 300 meters away from the lions so the chances of uh, any action now uh, they are very much slim So we are still going to sit here and see what is going to happen because when we are sitting here, the chances are very high to see something. Animals are all approaching from this very same direction. The animals are coming to these lions. The lions are just lying down. Animals are just presenting themselves. We are at the right spot at the moment. So now uh, the sun here in South Africa is still high up a little bit, but by the Masai Mara, David is chasing the sun before it get disappeared. Very good. And I'm sure you all know we are one hour ahead of South Africa. And that's why the sun also here will set one hour ahead of South Africa and so exciting to have giraffes and lions with Sydney. Well, I moved on a little bit and of course the sun kept going down and I have a different ball game now on the sky and I'm sure you are all ready with your answers. If anybody might have sent one word for the sunset we had before with all those clouds coming down and still it has not gone home yet. Heidi, very good. Magic is a great word. Magic, Heidi, you say? Very good, good. And yeah, I requested one word tweet on hashtag Safari Live on how that sounds it was. And still now, I think it is still beautiful, good looking. So at the moment, you're going to use Heidi's word, magic. And the different colors, like than what you had before, or the intensity has changed. And you can see the tree line there. Grenier, you say heavenly, just like heaven. Thank you very much. Heavenly is an equally beautiful word. So we got heavenly, we got magic. Keep sending them. And I was talking of the tree line on the horizon there. And I would guess most of those trees are what we call the tortured trees. And they're very iconic of the Mara Triangle. The dark clouds they're building. Not that you'd have any rain, but I'll not be surprised. Maybe later on tonight, Bungay, you think it might rain? 
Sean the Blind, that's a good one. The Blind, Magic and Heavenly. We've got three very powerful words. Thank you and keep bringing them on and we'll keep moving. And my plants, as I said earlier, if it would be possible, I'd be happy to see the waffles. How does it look, Bungay, on your left? Can I come? Is it come? It's good to go? All right. Bungay is my camera operator and also times he works as my co-driver. Yes, he says a side mirror. It's pretty cool. Okay. I'll put on my jockey now. It's going a bit cool. It'll help me just not uh, get cold at one point. As the cow is watching, doesn't come into us. Okay, going now to the waffles and hopefully, I haven't seen them for about a week. And hopefully they're still in the same place. Linda, thank you, great comment. And hopefully I will get them. I have not been there, as I said, for a couple of days. So Linda, don't go away, stay tuned, and hopefully we'll get the Commander-in-Chief of the North Clan, Wafus herself, and maybe with her granddaughter soup, who knows? Impalos, good evening Impalos. I've seen sometimes hyenas going for Impalos. We got a herd here, I should call it a breeding herd females and with one male as usual which is the typical structure of impolos beautiful light as they enjoy the sunset still have what Bungay told me it's not a sunset but the golden light I'll now be calling it the golden light and not sunset anymore Trucy, you say you love my jacket. Thank you very much. I've had this jacket for a long time. And I got it in a town called Arusha in Tanzania. So thank you very much. And hopefully you'll get some screenshots of my jacket anytime you see it, you think of Africa. That's the male that is in charge of all the females here. And he'll always make sure they stay very close to him and that guarantees he's able to meet with all of them and impalas being mixed feeders you notice they'll be eating both leaves or twigs grass at the same time and you can see all of them are feeding differently all these lovely animals to see and doing very well with all the rains or the short rains going on you can see some of the grass the short one especially is pretty green Yako you say you love those tails and you'll be surprised Yako if they happen to run and they lift the tail up it's all white and they use that tail or the white bit of it as a follow me sign you see some of them are just way up. just keep looking Yako and see when they wag those tails you can see the white part and truly also the black yeah you see that what I was talking about that's exactly what they do when they run but also the three black stripes also they use them during the day as follow me sign should they end up in some thickets or in grass and they're running or they're just walking basically and you cannot see your colleague you just follow those three black stripes or three black lines on their bumps there The male always being very busy putting the females in one particular area. And they don't last very long holding the harem because, of course, it's very tiring. Looking at what, maybe 30 females here? It's a lot of work. Move that way, go backwards, and making sure no other male comes in his territory. And, of course, in the process of you know working so hard to do that, they wear out very quickly. And then should another male come and try him out, he very easily loses the battle to a new male. South Africa now, I think, there's a very defined breeding season for impalas. And either this month or early December, they should be dropping down their lumps. It's 
See the concentrate on that short, yummy green grass. And not the dry grass like we saw the elephants earlier eating. Fantastic. Not once in a while, the other day, we saw some lions here in the Mara bringing down an impala. So these lions are still here very much relaxed and the hippopotamus is just lying down and standing, lying and standing. And it looks like these lions are waiting for the movement of that hippopotamus to come out from that thick bushes. I can see that uh, one of them is aiming at that hippopotamus. He's just looking at, at what the hippo is thinking about to do. Every time the hippo is moving, the lions concentrate. You can see that is the one which is monitoring the situation at the moment. The rest of the lions are all lying down flat. So you can see that uh, she is being fascinated by uh, that hippopotamus. Chris, the lions, they, they do try to take down this hippopotamus. And apart from the lions, other predators uh, who are not as um, large as the lions, such as the hyenas, has been spotted as well trying to take down the hippopotamus. It even happened by the Maasai Mara uh, some time ago when a group of uh, hyenas was trying to take down a hippopotamus by the dam. So hippopotamus, they do experience predation by this kind of uh, animals. Yes, they do have very thick skin, but lions, when they are too hungry, they do try their luck. And they don't always win, but they do try their luck. But now at this stage when the bush is so very dry, the grasses don't have a lot of nutrients, a lot of animals, different species, they are not in a very good condition, which might also contribute towards this shortage of strength when these animals are trying to defend themselves against these very big predators. So only the predators by this time of the year, they look healthy because it's when a lot of animals are dying from shortage of food and they are eating. So the predators is the one that don't normally lose weight. During the dry season is when predators are gaining quite a lot of weight because it's easy for them to get food. James, at the moment, uh, from when I've arrived here, the hippo has nev never shown any sign of interest. Look at that. You see that lion wants to try the hippo from the back. Look at that. The hippo is lying down, facing the western side, and the lion is pushing the hippo from behind. We might see some interaction there. So the, this, this hippopotamus have not yet shown us any level of aggression since our arrival. Maybe now that the lion is moving much more towards the hippopotamus, we might see something. Look at that. You can see the lion is getting closer and closer now. Look at that. Yeah, we can, we can uh, maybe share this sighting with the other viewers from other social networks. A very, very good afternoon and welcome to the beginning of the special broadcast. My name is Sydney Pumulani Mikosi and I'm having one of the best sightings at the moment. I have got, look at that now, something nearly happened. You can see that that lion nearly got charged there by the hippopotamus. The hippo was trying to come and he was so fast to react. This is happening not very far away from the Chitwa Chitwa. We are just by the western side of the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa. So the lion we are seeing there, 
there is quite a very big uh, size difference. Look at the hippo and the lion. The lion looks very tiny. The lioness we are seeing now is part of the Unkuma pride, which is the pride lying down right in front of me. So the thing is, the other ones are sleeping flat. Only that one fell interested to go and try the hippopotamus at the moment. So you can see that the hippopotamus turned and is looking at the lion. So you can see now that the lion gave up, he's coming back. And if we can wait here, we might see something uh, happening later on. Because this is not the first try. They tried the hippopotamus first during my arrival, and this is the second try. You can see now he's back for grooming. Maybe he's just now talking about lack of support when uh, she went for a try. <laughs> Michael from Denmark is so fascinated by what the lion is trying to do, trying such a very big and dangerous animal. You can see now he's visiting the second one. Maybe he's just complaining that, guys, why are you not supporting me? You know, we are working as a team, but I went there. You didn't follow me. Why? And maybe that is what he's asking now. So I'm just waiting here to see if something is going to happen. But from what I'm seeing, I think uh, the uh, the try uh, is over. They might try again. And thank you very, very much for all your questions and comments. Indeed, this has been a fabulous sighting. Welcome back from such a very interesting action between the hippopotamus and the lion. I think the, the voice of the squirrel is dying now. Listen to that. The squirrel has been calling for the whole one hour and now the voice I can hear that is starting to go down. <laughs> Look at that squirrel. It's right here by this branch on this tree. He has been on the other side and there's two of them. You see the one there and there's another one in the middle branch uh, shaking the tail, the one who's calling at the moment. So these are the squirrels who are trying by all means and tell everybody, go away, they are right here, don't come this side. So it's what they're doing at the moment. <laughs> so the, the, the giraffes were also told and I'm sure when the giraffe saw the lions, they were saying, what did I tell you? I told you from while well, you were too far, don't come this side. And then you came closer. You see, this is what is happening. The dangerous uh, lions are right here lying down at the moment. So now let's uh, cross over back to the Masai Mara and hear what is happening shortly after the sunset. Apologies uh, for the inconvenience due to lack of signal. We are back again at the lion sighting. And I don't think uh, it's, uh, it's bad to be with these lions because they are on a mission. They are lying down here, and while they are lying down, they can hear what's happening. Every movement taken by the hippo, they are waking up, they are checking. So it uh, looks like these lions, they are deliberately lying down here for the hippo to take any action, to come to the open space so that they can launch an attack. So you can see that male now is flat. All of them are flat at the moment. So none of them is monitoring the hippo anymore, but I know their hearing ability is excellent and their eyesight is excellent. These lions can still see. They are managing the hippopotamus while they're sleeping. So 
So you can see the Mangini lions here. If so now Steve is back and we can quickly go back to him and see what he wanted to show us previously. Sorry about the technical issues folks, not quite sure what happened there but our, hair, uh, our stalks are slowly trying to make, get a nice sort of comfortable position in the branches of this very tall and spiny tree. Um, one of the reasons they do that is because they are serval on the ground, they are jackal, they are all sorts of nocturnal predators that might snack on them. The reason why the ostriches don't do so well is of all the predators, they don't have the ability to fly up into the tree. And they reckon, just jumping back to some ostrich facts, that only about 33% of all ostrich e eggs laid are actually incubated which is a very low number to be, be to be fair and there's about 0.9% of the chicks per nest actually are reach adulthood so that is a very very low number and a lot of it to do with predation and a lot of the reasons why even birds that don't have the very necessary perching ability like these storks well will go up into the tree because well you don't want to fall victim to something on the ground that even though marabou storks are quite vile and smelly creatures and do feed a lot of carrion an opportunistic predator will snack on them very good well there was a question asked earlier and I managed to phone a friend and James Hendry himself was able to give me some information on how much a buffalo here comes a jackal James I was just talking about a predator on the floor and there's a jackal just run across the road in front of us if it comes out in the open we might be able to spot him Okay, well, we're going to go into IR now, folks, as the light you saw with David's sunset is setting. So we are going to go into the IR spectrum, um, Emma, if you don't mind. And so James Henry was kind enough to send me back some information. And uh, a buffalo in captivity will feed on about 15 kilograms of hay in one day. So it's about 30-odd pounds of hay. But obviously hay is generally quite nutritious. So out here in the wilds, you could probably estimate that a buffalo feeds on maybe 20, 20 odds, so about just over 40 pounds of food per day. And in the winter months, probably even more due to the lack of nutrients in, well, down in Juma, they'd have to feed on some more browse and really have to scrounge out to the landscape to get the necessary food. So it's, it's just a decent amount of food they have to feed on every single day. To keep them going so there we go that's to answer Ravinda's Robina sorry his question from earlier I wasn't able to find these answers anywhere but I phoned a friend and I have come up with the answers thank you <laughs> James if anything these storks would eat your baby to be honest um, I love the story of storks delivering babies it is always quite one of those nice sort of children's stories isn't it and well no these storks no, do not deliver babies. Um, I'm still, I actually need to read up on exactly where that story came from because it really is one of those ones that from us in the Western world we really do remember, don't we? Storks and babies. But the marabou stork, by no means are they the deliverers of babies. They walk through the landscape feeding on the baby birds that fall out of nests. I found them many times at Aquilia breast breeding sites. Uh, where babies are falling out, um, any baby bird that falls out of a nest, well, a marabou stork will snack on them, and they all will feed on carrion quite readily, and they're often found and associated, sadly enough, with human waste sites. So they do like to move into areas where human waste sites accumulate, and obviously those areas attract rodents and all sorts of other nasties. Okay, trying to find a nice comfortable spot is tricky. They haven't picked, in my opinion, the nicest tree in the world. And, oh, that's my spot. Joy, I'm not 100% sure if they eat trash, but they'll eat the waste products and maybe organic material that's there and, and the insects and the rodents that are associated with the dump site that is developed. Um, but I don't think they necessarily eat rubbish, but the organic material that is so often thrown away these days, I firmly believe that everybody should be responsible for recycling their waste and then also dealing with all of the organic waste that they generate. 
and it can be easily done with worm farms, uh, with compost piles, with black soldier flies. We can all deal with our own waste, but too often they are thrown away with the rest of the rubbish. And then where do we put it? Mm. Humanity is a very interesting species. Obviously, uh, birds like this, and some seagulls as well, they all just adapt. They adapt to live in those areas. Many seagulls down in the coastal areas uh, are attracted to waste sites and to sewage works because of the, the effluent, not necessarily the effluent itself, but the productivity that that effluent provides. And they've evolved and adapted. I mean, down in Cape Town, one of the best birding sites is at a sewage works. Really, really nice place to go and see birds, but I must warn you, if you develop gag reflex for certain things, I would not go there because, well, it's a good chance that you're going to gag. But a wonderful place to see many, many birds that living in aquatic systems. Sewage areas. Interesting, isn't it? Hmm. Anyway, we're going to move on and uh, carry on down this road. See if we can eventually maybe spot a lion in the long grass. That jackal unfortunately stayed a little bit low, but maybe not as low, in fact, as Sydney's lions. Mangani lions after. You can see that uh, the two Mangani males are now laying down right at the back here, and they look much better than previous because I can see that now I can see quite a lot of hairs developing there. So these are the victims of mange. Mange, it is a parasitic disease. Mange is caused by one of the parasites. And when the animal is beaten, uh, certain parts of the body got affected negatively, such as the elbows and the ears. Sometimes it can spread around the body. It's quite a very contagious disease. And animals can look very bad. It's associated with uh, itching, you see them scratching against the poles and scratching against the ground, and also loss of hairs. So they lose quite a lot of hairs when they've got that. You can see that one there on the stomach that there is still some grey areas showing that uh, it was uh, negatively affected. Also the elbows you can see right there. But I think this is way much better than uh, a few weeks ago. So if the other animals contact the, the, the blood, if they contact blood with this one, the chances of also picking up mange are very much high. From getting it from the parasite, the parasite bites, but they can also get it from the close contact. So they are still sleeping at the moment and the hippopotamus is just now on the other side uh, standing. Oh, look at how the hippopotamus is breathing. He's, he's breathing with the nose against the floor and you can see the dust when he's uh, breathing there. Look at that. You can see the dust coming out there. Look at that. <laughs> you see, there's the dust there as if there's a, a valve on the ground. Oh, there's uh, even ox peckers right there where the dust is coming from. Look at that. You can see that is the dust from the breath of this hippopotamus. <laughs> this is interesting. So he must be tired of standing there. That's why now. Uh, oh, Michelle, that was a wow, some something very unusual. So we don't see that very often. So you can see that now he's so tired and uh, he's trying to have the the mouth against the ground yeah he's still uh, pretty much relaxed there and maybe he, i cannot say he's still yeah he's still relaxed because he's not moving around but uh, he is worried about the lions he must be worried at the moment there he's relaxed because he doesn't have any other option So now let's go back to the Masai Mara where the successful bearder, David, is having something interesting. <laughs> well, this morning 
I saw some secretary birds on top of a tree with the sunset. And that, like, I'm ending my day with a different bird, or rather in the sunrise in the morning, on sunset now, with crown cranes, and not two, but three. The, sun, the secretary birds were two this morning, with the sunrise, and now the sunset, I don't have two, but three crown cranes. After having spent the better part of the day feeding, it's time to dry their feet or come to their nest. Don't fly, don't go anywhere. Look at that wingspan, huge wingspan they got. And yeah, um, in the final control says what they're not flying away, what they're doing is tree yoga. I love that. Um, they're doing tree yoga. I love that. And you can see the balance on that particular one, on that one small branch. Not really sure exactly what she's trying to do. Look at how they are bending. That's exactly yoga. I agree with you, M. That's exactly how yoga is done. And then they go. Mm. And I would not be surprised, you know, that they're just stretching their muscles there. Having been eating a lot of insect like the whole day. In the background, we can hear hyenas going. This is the national bird of a country west of Kenya called Uganda. You may not see the colors pretty well because now we are in infrared. That's why she appears black and white. And true, that's yoga she's doing. And then up, facing the other way, stretching the muscles from one side of the shadow of the shoulder. In general, they go in twos. They're very monogamous, but once in a while you might get them three, and I'm thinking one of them could be a youngster. And I'm thinking, well, she's doing a better job than her, and we should just compare, because I think we have a lot to learn from the animals as human beings. We have always seen when lions wake up from, you know, laying down, how they stretch their forelegs and they stretch their spinal cords. I think we have everything to learn every day. So many countries in the world have national birds, so they said this is the national bird for Uganda. We have like the American bald eagle in Kenya. We have the lilac breasted roller. And you just see it, the silhouette. What happens when you use infrared, it makes sure you do not influence the animal bee, be it a bird, by shining an artificial light. Because if they have a nest there, would be definitely interfering with their behavior. They need just to enjoy the darkness. Well, being dark doesn't mean we don't see nice stuff, and I think Steve might have spotted something for himself. Yes, we do. We've managed to finally find you a serval. I know the light's not great, folks. We are in infrared, as said before. But look at the size of those ears, and well, look at the eyes, how they're shining. Servals are able to be nocturnal as well as diurnal. Oh, and well, there's nothing, no better camouflage than a termite mound. <laughs> oh, how disappointing. We had it, I was moving through the long grass almost like a jackal, and then I was like, what is that? Once again, Elvis told me what it was, and it was indeed a serval cat. And beautiful spots, beautiful coloration enormous ears that is the sort of way you see servals normally you see them and then they're gone uh, that serval cat we had a week or so ago with the kittens that is just not normal to see them so relaxed and to be able to follow them for a long time is absolutely fantastic and well here yeah, we had a brief view and that's all you're getting this evening but i'll take that that was so awesome well done well done just in time Moving through, looking for any of the birds that are trying to... Oh, there he is, James. Oh, he's gone. That's too far. Proud Kip Mama, those eyes are incredible, aren't they? They see right through us. Oh, I wish I could have eyes like that. You notice how forward-facing they are. Characteristic position of a, of a um, hunter. 
of the predator, eyes facing forward. Obviously, those animals that are defending themselves against predators have got eyes on the side of the head. A nice little trait to look for at an animal when you're thinking, what are they? Are they prey or are they predator? Helps with the binocular vision, the focus point of direction, and the beautiful spots help it to just blend in, melt in with this environment. And can you imagine how many servals we drive past on a regular basis? So many. Well, the serval is moving on the forage, on the hunt for something to eat, and well, hopefully David and his lion, or oh, sorry, Sydney and his lions will be up to something soon. I am so jealous about these uh, several sightings because I haven't seen the several for quite a long time now. But one day I'm going to go to the Masai Mara and see those severs. Here I am still with the Unguhumas who are still resting at the moment. Nothing is happening. They are just rest resting, waiting for the action from the hippopotamus. Once the hippos start moving, we might see some actions taking place here as we saw the two attempts earlier. So if you can check here where these females are, they are right lying down on a pathway. And the other ones are also on a pathway. So the possibilities of other species as well coming down to the waterhole, make use of the very same pathways, they are very high. As we saw the uh, giraffes trying to come down, make use of the very same pathways. So because they are used to walk on this same pathway, chances of these other different species to come past here, they are very high. They might be lucky and get an easy meal. Uh, Chris, the hippopotamus can go out of the water holes for a day. I have seen a hippopotamus far away from the water hole before. Unfortunately, they did not charge us, but I was on a guided walk, and this hippo was just uh, hiding by one of the thick bushes. Hippopotamus, during the day, when it's hot, if they get trapped by the sun, they can be able to find a nice protective spot and hide there and carry on when the sun cools down late in the evenings. These animals, now at night, they can go for more than 16 to 30, uh, 30 kilometers from the water holes. So if you can check around the water holes where we are, it is uh, looking very overgrazed. The, these animals are pressurizing these grasses in this area all the time. So that's why now they must have to move long distances. For them to graze and get enough here by the water hole is not possible. So they must have to travel long distances and even go past the Juma Game Reserve. They graze in and also by other neighboring properties. They need quite a lot of energy and they can also store some of the uh, food in the stomach in order to survive much longer if there is no enough uh, vegetation for them to eat. They are not ruminants, they are hind gut fermenters, but they've got that ability. Oh, yeah, the giraffes are coming from, from this side. We might see another action. <laughs> David, <laughs> the girls, they need to go and get some food. And the boys need to go and patrol their territory so that the girls can be safe inside. So both of them has got a huge responsibility. One is responsible to bring food. Another one is responsible for the protection of the whole pride. So now those giraffes are just coming to check if the lions are still in the area. It's the very same two giraffes we saw earlier on trying to be stalked by these rhin uh, lions. So, but now I can see they are trying to open a very big gap. They don't want to come closer anymore. So giraffes, have, they've got a very uh, good advantage because they are so very much tall 
and yes the vocal call is not uh, that much noisy they don't make nice vo vocal calls but the the tip behind the ears that bright color you're seeing when they're spreading is what they're using for communication that is how they can be able to communicate and spot each other from a long distance So you can see that uh, there is uh, an accommodation, you can see the roofs there, that is Chitwa Chitwa, it is the accommodation which is against the Chitwa Chitwa Dam. So sometimes when we are following the animals, the lodge is appearing. Don't get surprised, it is the lodge which is attached to the dam where these hippopotamus are residing. So this side, no, nothing is happening at the moment. So we will wait here and see what is going to happen. But now, uh, Steve is so jealous about the Unkuhumas. He's also looking for his own lions. Let's see what he's up to. <laughs> I wish I had lions. Looking for them indeed. We've covered a huge amount of ground and what we found is lots of buffalo, lots of zebra with no lions following them. So we're on this road, slowly gonna make our way back and who knows what we could find. It's cooled down quite a lot. So this is the time when the lions get up and start moving. So wherever the arenas have been secreting themselves for the day, we're hoping that we might get them soon. We know that a lot of the lions like to move onto the road, easier to travel, faster distance, or cover distance a bit faster. But it's so interesting, the Oklahoma Pride on, on Chitra again, uh, Londolozi, which is further south, where the Birmingham boys have been spending a lot of their time, uh, the Londolozi blog is discussing um, the Oklahoma's being on their property of late. So how's that? They've gone for a little visit. They've taken the kids to visit Dad for the weekend. <laughs> Find that quite, quite funny. So what we know about lion dynamics and the movements of prides is really just can, every day can be thrown out of the window. Anything you think you know about how lions move, well, it can be written down, you can see it happen, and it'll still surprise you. We see the lion prides moving around here with almost no understanding of exactly why they're doing what they're doing, and the only thing I can say is where the food is. That's primarily the way they're moving. And, um, sorry about the bumps, they just go through bouts of calling just so that they can, okay, you're over there today, I'm going to make sure that I'm over here. And they just buffer themselves with, with calls, so as to eliminate any of that direct conflict that would invariably happen in an area of, of prey abundance. But for the moment there's plenty to go around, and uh, so interesting the Unkuhumas have ranged so far south. I wonder if anyone else got any thoughts on that. Any thoughts on the Unkuhumas taking their kids to meet dad or fathers? <laughs> it, it is, it's about a 20, 20 minute drive if you went straight. Uh, I'm trying to think of the distance, it's quite far. Uh, but lions, you know, lions do what they want to do and maybe they followed the buffalo down and they just got a bit disorientated. It is probably, Chris, you hope they bring back the Birmingham boys. Well, that would be something, wouldn't it? We've all been waiting in anticipation over the last however many months for this clash of the titans. Sorry, we've got some buffalo in the road ahead. I don't want to blind them. So the clash of the titans of the Birminghams versus the Evokers, I think that would be quite something to behold. Uh, but maybe, maybe lions are as sentimental as we are and they just took the kids to visit dad or multiple dads for the weekend. You know, it was Thanksgiving the other day, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Birmingham's were around in Juma when I started in February. Feb January, February, the Birmingham's were still a fixture in Juma. And since I think it's about April, I might be a little bit off on the dates, about April or so, it's when the Birmingham's kind of vanished down south. And since then the Evokers have kind of moved in. And so maybe just before Christmas and 
around Thanksgiving, DV, it would be something to see. The battle of three versus four. Battle hardened veterans versus some three upstarts. I think it'd be great. So, around Christmas, Thanksgiving, what a great time to take the kids to go and see Dad. I think that's very sentimental. <laughs> Sorry that I'm anthropomorphizing our lions, but that is that is what happens. I'm sorry, Emma, I didn't quite get that from D. Through this herd of buffalo. Yeah. D Lee, it is indeed Dad's time to babysit, but um, I don't know how long they stayed for. I just got a quick glance at it. I didn't actually read too much about it, but just the highlights that they were down there. And I do believe the Birmingham's are still in the area. So, interesting. What's going on? Is something running over here? Oh, no. Not running. It is a night jar. Moving very quickly. Night jars, believe it or not, have got enormous eyes shining back in the darkness. So, like we see the serval in the darkness, those eyes are very bright. The night jar's got enormous eyes. And they're flittering from, from this way to that. Probably the swamp night jar because of where we are. But anyway, David has managed to sort out his infrared lights and well, he's looking at some elephants in the darkness. Well, I have seen some ellies, I have seen some zebras and I'm getting very close, close to the Wild Force territory. I'm even confused where I want to go now. But before I get to the Wafos territory, let me see if Bungay can catch these zebras. It's just ahead of us, about 11 o'clock. I'm spoiled by choice. Look at that. And how things look at night in infrared. And the zebras are looking at the elephants. As it gets dark, visibility becomes very poor for most of the animals. So the common zebra or the ground zebras and they can hear some hyenas going well as you watch these zebras let's find out what Sydney's sighting looks like the lion and the hippopotamus are looking at each other look at the oh you have seen that? <laughs> the hippopotamus turned another lion trying his luck again. So you can see the lion is coming back. So you can see these lions, they have got a mission. They are waiting for that hippo to come out of the open space. Because at the moment, they have done their own assessment and they can see that it won't be possible to coordinate hunting and take that hippo in the middle of the, uh, the bushes. But now you can see this is the third or fourth one going and attempt to chase that uh, hippo. They are trying to get that hippo out and their strategies are not working. Andy, here we are talking about uh, the third largest land mammal. It can weigh up to 1,006 to 1,700 kilograms. And that is too big. This is quite a very big animal. So these lions, they've got to work hard in order to take down these animals. Because it's not just about the weight. It's the weight and the equipment this hippo has got. This hippo has got very big tooth which can grow up to 40 to 50 centimeters. That is telling you any mistake, one, hip, one, one lion is going to get badly injured and some might even lose their life here during the battle with the hippopotamus. So you can see now one of them is starting to groom and uh, now the sun has gone down here in South Africa. Uh, I am not seeing the sun anymore. I'm just seeing reflection by the sky, which is telling us that is a time, normal time for the lions to wake up. That's why grooming is started there. Self-grooming is happening. They might start to greet each other and groom each other and then take the hippo uh, and try to take the hippo down. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> Paula, they are waiting for two things to happen. They are waiting for that hippo to come out of the open space and they are also waiting for the darkness. But that is normal. Lions are much more active between dawn and dusk. So that is when they are going to work. But these ones here are trying to get the hippo out. Let's wait and see. Maybe this hippo is, is not going to come out also during the dark. Because if he comes out here, we are going to see something interesting tonight. Uh, Mrs. Lapwing, let me try to judge the distance now. The dam is just about uh, 500, 600 meters away from where we are. So uh, approximately 600 meters or less from where we are. And the distance between hippos and the lions is just about 20 meters. 20 meters. So you can see that at this distance, 600 meters, anything can happen. A hippo cannot manage to get to the waterhole before they caught him or before they cornered him. So the hippo is not safe at the moment. I think it's quite a number of lions. Nine lions can be able to confuse the hippo and make him tired. I don't think he's going to manage to maintain the same speed for about six to 700 meters. Yeah, they can run 36 kilometers per hour, but these lions, where they are, they are right at his, he can't come out because they are right in front of him. If they are all trying to go for an attack, And these lions, child of the universe, uh, they've got to try harder. I am strongly agreeing with you. And this is also going to uh, help them in order to learn uh, to take uh, this kind of dangerous animal. I'm not too sure if it's this, this is the first time they're trying the hippo. Uh, they might have tried the hippos many times before because hippos and them, they're active at the same time. They're active at night. They might have encountered each other a lot during the night. So, but this hippo, let me just uh, maybe uh, talk about this. This hippo has been disturbed. This hippo is standing and lying down, and I'm sure he's getting tired. I don't think tonight, when he's doing his night activities, will be able to be very strong uh, like before. Chances of this uh, lions uh, to confuse or to take down that hippo, they are very high, because you can see he's tired. How many times have we seen him lying down since we have been here? And that is a sign that the hippo is tired. So now let's go back to Steve in darkness. We are in the darkness and just when you think the migration has ended, we come across an enormous herd of wildebeest that's crossing in front of us with the zebra counterparts. Here they go. We've already had a number of them crossing. There you go. Traffic on the Sunday afternoon is, is horrendous here in the Mara Triangle. These are scenes that we saw a month ago. And I haven't seen again since, but the wildebeest have returned with the rains, brought the green grasses and whatever it might be, climate change or management practices down in the Serengeti has caused them to come back. Gina, they do have quite creepy eyes and running like that, they actually resemble a hyena running in the grass, except there are thousands of them. I'm not sure if you can quite hear them off to our right hand side. They're making, well, they were making a lot of noise. But it's calmed down. There was a plenty that were crossing in front when we stopped. And well, when you find a herd of wildebeest, generally in the Mara, in my experience, lions are not far behind. 
can't help themselves, the noises and the smells of these animals. Okay, well, while we try and either wait or get through this traffic jam, let's go see if David has yet arrived with the North Clan. Well, I come. Finally, I have arrived at the Wafus Den. This is not Wafus, but it's one member, and I think she's a female, of the North Clan. A group of hyenas is called a clan, and where we are now, that's the exact barrel for Wafus herself. And I'm not sure this is one of the senior females in the clan that has been taking care of Wafu's cubs. Hyenas very matriarchal and maybe Wafu's might have left this under some instructions to take care or babysit her cubs as maybe she would have gone out patrolling the boundaries or getting herself something to eat or just scouting her territory. She seems to be curious of something. I don't know what she's looking at. What are you looking at? Now I just want to switch, move the camera to about 12 o'clock Bungay from where we are because I thought I saw some cubs. I don't know how far the IR will go. But what I'm thinking is for us to switch the camera to about 12 o'clock. And I'm just trying to keep my voice low. My voice knows that we're not very loud. Because at that point I saw one coming from a distance. You can see the eyes, they're twinkling. Not sure that is Waffles, but Waffles is not at the den at the moment. Cubs, I'm sure they are within or inside the barrel. As you can see there. There's another hyena there. Always very difficult to tell a male from a female. But hyena is very matriarchal, where the females are always in charge. One of our leading females here is called Soup who is a granddaughter of Wafos. And I think Soup got two cubs, as Wafos also got two cubs. One called Ilovio, and the other is called Geronid. Who are you looking at? It's very quiet at the moment, but it might not take long before they start calling. Just so you can hear some hyenas calling. Proud Cut Mama, I'll just walk you fast to Waffles, and your question is how does the clan develop and grow? Hyenas, just for, I'm sure you know, they're very complex. Or their social relationship is very complex for the hyenas. And they're very matriarchal, where we have the females pulling the shots, just like the elephants. I just learned the other day that Wafus fought her way up to be top of this clan or to be the commander-in-chief. She didn't come from a lineage where either the mother was a high-ranking female. But one of her granddaughters, called Soup, has taken over as one of the senior most, uh, I would say, females. And Wafus got two of her cubs, and possibly one of that cub might take over from Wafos. So it's always female, uh, the lineage is very much female dominated and the males do not have much say when we come to managing or looking at the hyenas complex system. So Wafos is getting a bit old and I'm sure of her two cubs, if not soup, maybe who might take over. Of course, as I said earlier, she's a granddaughter of Wafos. One of her cubs might be the one in charge or could be running or managing this particular clan. So in that barrel there, I'm sure we've got some cubs inside and it might not take long before they come out. 
other you ask whether the hyenas are nocturnal and yes and they are sojourner depending on the size of the clan depending on availability of food you'll see hyenas both day and night it's a very good question other waffles once in a while you meet him out there looking for food you know during the day at night you'll come here she's here at night you'll come like now she is not here but I'm sure in that particular hole that's where she lives and you notice the barrel is not as big it's not meant for fully grown hyenas it's just meant to hide the cubs and that way the hyenas make sure there would be other predators like either lions or leopards don't reach the cubs the adults will always be staying outside the barrows. Now we're going to wait until waffles come back. We have no idea where she is. Lee, yes, they are very complex and how they live and how they divide their roles is quite complex and Sydney has a predator crossing somewhere. So I've got uh, the Unkuhuma Pride. It's just about to cross now towards the uh, Torchwood. They might be here at any second. Look, uh, the first one is leading and the rest are just coming behind her. So it means now they might execute their mission much more this side. They gave up when it comes to the dangerous hippopotamus. So you can see the stomachs are empty. So these animals, they've got to uh, hunt for... So you can see that now they are starting to cross. The second one is going there. All on a convoy, crossing at the same place. And this is beautiful, look at that. This is an amazing sighting. I think the rest of the pride is uh, far behind as now I can see there's quite a very big gap between this one cruising now and the other ones at the back. Okay, I don't know if maybe they are uh, incited by something. Linda just in time you can see they are looking back there to check if the other pride members are following or not so i'm just going to <laughs> debra is good that they have left the hippopotamus i think the hippo is lucky because that hippo have displayed her level of aggression and they got nervous so now that they've crossed, I'm going to have to see if we can see these other ones which are about to come and cross, or else I can see if we can still see those ones who have already crossed. So those ones who are about to cross are coming to cross at any time now. I can see they're right here, led by a, a male and a female following behind, or is it a young male? I can't see well there now. So look at that, you can see this very beautiful mane there. He's trying to check where the other ones are at the moment. He can't see them, but he knows they are somewhere this side. So look at the tassel of the a tail. So this is the only species amongst the felines, the cats, which has got the tassel by the tail. Don't get uh, surprised. I do have some other vehicles also enjoying same sighting uh, we are having now. 
So the tip of the tail, you start to notice that uh, tussle when they're about seven to eight months. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we are looking at the beginning of a collection. Look, now I can see the Mangani lions are also coming to a uh, crossover. Look at that. You can see the condition is not that very bad like before. There is a little bit of improvement. Yeah, there is uh, quite a very big improvement now. They are recovering. So at the beginning, uh, these uh, two, they were so uh, looking bad and uh, quite a lot of hair has been lost during that stage. But now everything is starting to recover. Oh, the other one lost the tip of the tail, doesn't have the tassel anymore, <laughs> the one in front. David, indeed, this has been a ton of improvement. You can see that the one who is now navigating there or um, urinating there does not even have a oh even the other one as well the tails you see they don't have the tassels anymore maybe they have lost the tassels when they started losing the hairs because of mange because all of them don't have the tassels anymore so it means this is one of the results of that kind of a disease so look at that the tails are very clean there so it means they lost all those nice uh, tussle black hairs. So now I am going to uh, pull further and see if we can improve this sighting. This is amazing. So now let's quickly go to the Masai Mara where David uh, is having the hyena cup. Well, my drive all the way here was pretty worth it. And we have seen a few fully grown hyenas some couple of minutes ago, but now we have found one of the mothers with her two cubs and I might keep my voice a bit soft because they're very close to the mother. I can't see very well, I'm not sure if they're nursing or not. But this is one of the females in the Waffles Kingdom or in the Waffles clan of the North clan of hyenas. That shows she's very relaxed with us. Oops, she puts her head up. We had zebras from the background that I could hear. And like any other mother with natural instincts when you have a baby, you're always very alert of any sound or movement. See how dark or black the cubs look? An indication to me they could be less than three months. The spot doesn't or don't show until the cap is three months and above. Very sleepy cubs. I would, I would have guessed by now they should be out and about playing. Looks pretty cool. To me it's like they're nursing, I guess. I initially thought they were, but I was not very sure. And I know cubs are some of the you know, small little babies, I know they nurse for a very long time, which is quite an issue for cubs, or for carnivores rather. At times they might nurse for up to a year and a half, which is very unlike carnivores, before they are weaned. And again, remember, this is a very interactive safari. Telling you asking whether hyenas are omnivorous, and I would say hyenas are carnivores. Carnivores because they will only eat meat and they either tail and hunt for themselves or occasionally they scavenge, but also they be known to steal 
meat or kills from other predators like lions or leopards or hyenas. The very good hunters stay land by themselves, but if an opportunity of stealing meat comes, they've been known to do that. Thailand hyenas got wonderful hearing. They can pick a sound of a lion cracking a bone way like 10 kilometers away. You would imagine 10 kilometers away and you pick a sound of some vibration. Very high auditory they got, to about six something, 6.2 or 6.5 miles, picking sound of even lions going for a hunt. Or as soon as they can hear them strangling the animal even before they start eating it, hyenas can pick that sound of vibration and definitely go there. This particular clan, we have seen it a number of times going to lions and stealing their kill. There's a particular pair of lions around here that's called Owino. Owino is a pair of lions Steve has been trying to locate. We haven't seen for a couple of days. And these hyenas have always picked the kill from the Owinos and snatched the meal. What they do, they get close to the kill and they build in numbers and they intimidate them. Hi cabbies, they must be very hungry. I'm just seeing two of them. In the background you can hear more hyenas either heading home. It's very tiny cubs. Again because see it because of their colour being black. That's how they're born. And again, they say it's rather unusual to see the mothers nursing them for long. And I'm very happy all of you are enjoying this view. And uh, I hope, uh, what was her name, Linda, you're still tuned on, tuned in, and you're watching these cabs. You are happy when I said I might be visiting the Waffles or the North Clan. And here we are. How sleepy and how peaceful this mother is with her two cubs. But once in a while, head up, listen, look, smell. And I'm sure, should there be an opportunity of some food somewhere, she'll stop nursing her cubs and go look for some food. Occasionally we have seen some other senior ranking members bring food. Why, well, that's a very good question and you wonder why she cannot sleep while they're nursing. And I'm sure she is having a bit of catnap for a couple of seconds or minutes. But, like, you see that one, YT? But, like any, you know, mother, they have natural instincts, especially when they have very tiny calves, very small calves like this. And the whole idea is you have to be very alert. I mean, uh, if any challenges they face, I'm talking about either leopards or maybe other hyenas, or lions because of what's called predator competition. So she cannot take any chances. You see how she's looking, she's very alert. It's so natural for all animals in the wilderness when they have their young ones. They become super alert and very conscious of any sound out there. But I think the cubs, my guess is they're both nursing and maybe having little cut naps because they look so, so peaceful. And how nice to see such a relationship. Interesting because I was saying earlier, talking about the hyena cubs, how, how long they take before they're weaned. And even when they're born, they're born with their teeth on, you know, they got erupted teeth as they're born. And unlike many other cubs of, you know, the predators like lions or leopards or cheetahs, the eyes closed, the hyenas upon the eyes open, which is quite something. I tried to remember the word we use is either precocchio, I'm trying to remember that word. And very intelligent animals. People have always mistaken hyenas for thieves and uh, stealing other people's, you know, meat and going to the farms in the villages eating goats and sheep stock or like you know cows too but not really they're very intelligent animals
proud cat mama, very good that the hyenas, especially the females, are very vigilant when it comes to their cubs. And it's very true. You cannot take any chances, proud cat mama, with this hyena, even myself. And that's why she cannot afford to sleep for over a minute or 30 seconds max. She'll put her head down and she'll keep an eye, just making sure all is good because of her cubs. We want to respect this female here for doing such a great job to make sure that uh, nobody's coming close to her cabbages. Mrs. Slapwing, sorry, um, I apologize that for that. Mrs. Slapwing, I would agree with you, mamas should not sleep. And I'm talking of all mamas out here in the wilderness, even for female lion, you know, and for female lions, elephants, zebras, any animal that will have, you know, a small little, small little young one, they never sleep. I agree with you, Mr. Lapwing, 100%. They must have been very hungry. And it has also been said, hyena's milk is lots of, you know, lots of, got a lot of protein, and it's one of the most nutritious milk in the world. All right, I think Steve today he is getting lucky and lucky with Savos. Yes, look at what we found. This is maybe even the relaxed female that we saw before. Look at this serval. Spotted her in the road up ahead, those beautiful bright eyes. I don't know if it's a female, I honestly couldn't tell you right now, but it's very relaxed, but it might also be due to the fact that we have no lights on and the vehicle is switched off. Look how delicately it moves through the long grass, those legs easily being placed in little spots. It knows exactly where to place them. And like a typical cat, back leg goes where front foot was before. The ears scanning the terrain short stubby tail Mrs. Anna it's always stalking the thing is is that it's not really necessarily hunting a particular animal like a lion or leopard would do it's moving through the long grass waiting for something to move something to flick a tail or an ear or rustle some grass so it's moving through very delicately so that obviously its own movements uh, don't give away any sound which would impede its own hearing and anything that gives away the slightest of sort of sounds will be pounced upon. Moving the ears from side to side delicately once some prey is detected, it would then go into a little bit more of a deliberate sort of posture, probably bunching the back legs up like we see leopards do. And then launching. Hello. I wonder if she knows she's a star right now. Beautiful camera work there, James. There we go, the third or should I say, yeah, the fourth serval of the afternoon. Kathy, I'm not aware of them being endangered or at any risk. Uh, they are quite common and popular up here in these grassy sort of landscapes. We just don't see them. I mean, the other two that we've, or three we've seen this evening were very, very hard to spot and they disappeared quite quickly. But in this landscape, you can imagine how many there probably are moving in and around. Um, but they like these open grasslands. But yes, most invariably in areas where there are people and um, poaching is a problem, then I suppose their, their numbers do decline because there could potentially be a problem for, for chickens and for small lambs and things in agricultural areas. So I don't think they do very well in high populated areas with people but just like that the serval cat has disappeared 
Well, that was a marvelous spot. And well, we've been navigating herds and herds of wildebeest and we had another bat-eared fox. But anyway, all of the ears are out this evening and it seems like David's hyena are having some fun. Well done, Steve. Hopefully you'll get another savo cut before you get home. But what we just found out now with Bungay is the commander-in-chief have just arrived. And now he's getting all the warm welcome, all the greetings, all the red carpet for Waffles to come back home. I don't know where she's been. And she's hiding in that little bush. She, has, she came out, then she disappeared again. And she all the tales of this. How it is up. And we're going to see waffles any time now. A very creepy way of greetings for the hyenas. Hopefully they're going to turn around. It was such a nice welcome they have given her. All right, waffles, won't you waffles to step forward? Uh, oh, that's the ritual they go through. And they tend to raise their leg. And there she is. And Emily Fender Control says, Yay, Waffles. And even when we saw it, Bungay saw it before me. I'm like, yeah, that's Waffles. And she has arrived in style. And oh, that small little ritual to welcome Waffles back. You can see how she's respected and all the submission going on there from all these other females. And I'm sure maybe they're giving her some feedback. All is well. The cubs are fine. Welcome back. We have missed you. And there are Waffles walks. And this is the leader of this clan. Her name is Waffles. And we've got some researchers here from Michigan University or Michigan State University, I guess, that have, you know, followed them for a very long time. And they have been naming these hyenas or they have a nomenclature from some theme of food. Waffles, they soup. And the other day I was talking, we should start comparing the hyenas here and the hyenas in Juma. So you can see that I have got a cookie and a cup at the moment here in Juma after watching a lovely hyena with calves by the Masai Mara. Look at that. It's time now for the little one to be observed. Listen. <laughs> That's how the little one is calling. So when the mother is doing that, grooming the little one helps with the blood circulation and activate the reproductive organs and the excretory organs as well. So these two are the oldest so the one for cocky is the smallest so the little ones are so inquisitive so these little ones are so inquisitive and they are just being curious and going everywhere checking what's happening here so they are not uh, aware of what is happening here at the moment hyenas sometimes they come Close the adults come close to the cars and punch tires. So you can see that uh, now the listen to that. So the little one is trying to call. So these little ones, when they're learning, when they're playing together with uh, the adults, it's when they're learning how to survive. So they have been moved around for quite a long time. 
I think now is the third or the fourth time they are moving from one den to the next, sometimes going back to the similar den. So they can be nomadic when they're having the cups. But all this is happening for the safety of the little ones. When they're in the den, they assess the, the availability of fleas and parasites. If it's getting too much, they know the little ones are going to, su- uh, they are going, are going to suffer, they must move them. And when there's a development of smell, then they must have to move the little ones. So these little ones are looking very healthy. Look at that. And they're full. They must be drinking too much. So, but when you see the little ones uh, healthy like this, it means the mothers, they are eating quite a lot of meat, healthy meat. So today, Cookie's cub is not showing dominance. I think she's thirsty, uh, is drinking too much from the mother at the moment. can hear that is cookies oh she's making a very uh, lovely call there she's suckling at the moment and she's just whistling at the same time Laura, indeed, this is amazing. Look at these little ones. They are so very happy. And this is one of those great sightings. Look at that. Now, Koki is looking at us. And the little one is trying to press the mammary gland so that uh, she can be able to get quite a lot of milk coming out. So the hyena's milk has got quite a lot of protein content. And is the it's one of those carnivores who can be able to suckle their little ones up to 18 months. That is quite a lot. So look at the structure of this animal. So now we are going to give you this uh, sighting from a FLIR thermal camera. Don't get surprised. Don't change the settings from the TVs. Uh, this is from us. We are just trying, trying to show to... you the animal from a camera which detects the heat signatures. Your settings by the TVs are not wrong. So look at that. That's... So, so you, can... you can see that uh, these animals they have been very hot during the afternoon because uh, where you see that the animal it looks very bright it means the temperature is high and where it's yellow it means it's very very high so you can see underneath the stomach is yellow and by the ears and here by the armpit is telling you that that is where now the body of this animal is very much hot and the blue colors on the ground uh, is telling you that the temperature is very much minimal. So maybe now these little ones are just now well fed before the adults move away to go and look for something to eat. Actually, this is one of those great sightings. I am really enjoying this sighting at the moment. So this little one has got a big house. You see that house there next to the adult? If you look at that uh, termite mound next uh, to uh, the adult, that is where they're staying. It's a very big house. And that house is very much safe. The problem is this house is used by the animals as a timeshare. Today we've got the hyenas, tomorrow warthogs are staying there. After that, it's gonna serve as a den for another species as well. So when the little ones are there, they are also at high risk because the other predators, such as wild dogs, if they discover the dens, they, they look for them and kill them. So just to minimize uh, the pre- uh, just to minimize uh, the predators in the area, so competition is too high. Has got nothing to do with territoriality. Is about uh, the competition of food.
Hey, Steve has got another several at the moment. Steve is leading in terms of the several sightings. I'll call you Mr. Several these days. I do indeed. This is the fifth serval we have seen this evening. So as far as what we've spotted from the road, these animals are certainly not endangered in the Mara. Oh no, Sydney's calling me Mr. Serval. Shame, Sidders, I know you're quite jealous of us seeing these servals, but you'll get your opportunity, I'm sure, my friend. And it's one of those cats, you just got to go to the right habitat and you will find them. And well, this is clearly the right place. And well, this one seemingly has been a little bit more r resting. Now it's up. Oh, hello. Serval Steve, Mrs. Anno. Uh, thank you. Oh, there's the typical cat stretch. It definitely was having a bit of a rest. And now it's going to slink away into the long grass. Isn't that a beautiful sight? Lovely patterns, spots, rings on the tail, and long stripes on the back of the neck provide the perfect camouflage for a cat that lives in long grasslands. Gorgeous. Well, as it moves slowly away out of the IR spectrum, yet again our beard indeed. Well, we this is what is happening. The spotlight is assisting, obviously, and those beautiful emerald shining eyes are what stand out for us in the darkness. And well, as we see our last serval depart into the thickets there of the long grass, David is still with the North Clan. Well, I think Steve has had his most setting of Savocat today than any other day of his life. I won't confirm that with him during dinner time and our cabbies here are still nursing. Either apart from nursing, they're getting the wonderful warmth from their mother because they have remained in that position for the last half an hour. How beautiful is this and how peaceful is this? I'm sure in one word also, as I was talking about the sunset, you can just tweet hashtag safari live and tell me, David, that is peaceful. That is very cool. That's so epic. Heavenly are some of the words I got earlier. Magic. Because such a nice mother. And this enhances her bond with her young cubs. And you look carefully, one of her legs, I guess, is just holding the cub in position. I think the front right leg. Thank you, Bungay. What a nice mother. Very complex to understand when they go through side where one cub tends to dominate the other. And unfortunately, sometimes you get one losing his life and one surviving. Sorry, am I missed that? Uh, Tommy, Mr. Shana, thank you very much. I agree with you. It is, I mean, uh, just warms them there and the hearts come very, very close. It's very heartwarming. And this is exciting. It has given me a very good end of the day and we go across to South Africa. And from myself and Bungay, goodbye from the Mara Triangle. You can see there is a big competition between Juma and Masai Mara at the moment. So the Juma Dan, uh, the Juma clan is suckling and uh, by the Masai Mara there was also na nursing. So you can see that now uh, ours, they want to take over and at the moment the cups for Pretty got disappeared to the other side. Maybe now Pretty is giving the cup some orders that you have to remain in the den. I'm just about to leave now.
and you can see now we've got Koki and the cub also they are very relaxed. It has been a lovely afternoon and coupled with quite a lot of sightings all the way from the Masai Mara in Kenya as well as here in South Africa by the western side of the Greater Kruger National Park. Thank you very very much for all your questions and comments. We are going to meet again tomorrow morning. We are going to carry on and bring you the best wildlife experience ever.